The 2020 US presidential elections have been among the most polarizing in recent history. We did win this election. With a soaring pandemic, many have chosen to vote by mail from the safety of their homes rather than risking a possible infection. But what if you could cast your vote online? If anything, this pandemic has reminded us that congregating in confined spaces and breathing each other's fluids is indeed disgusting. According to a study from One Logging, a plurality of people believe the US should move to online voting, with 59% of respondents expecting online voting to become reality within five years. About half the respondents say they would be more likely to turn out if they could cast their vote over the internet. It seems like given enough political capital, letting people return their ballots through an app on their phones could soon become a new option. And in fact, three states, West Virginia, Delaware, and New Jersey, have already started piloting systems to allow overseas military personnel and people with some disabilities to vote online. Local pilots of internet voting have taken place in Utah, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington. Evidently, we have the technology to make online elections happen, and it would be hugely beneficial. Voting online could increase the turnout by up to 50% and would provide a safer alternative for those who can't risk going outside. After all, you can bank, file your taxes, or even buy a house over the internet, so why not vote online? You may be surprised to hear this, but the answer has only three words. CIA. And I don't mean that CIA. Or do I? I mean, <coughs> of, of course not. I simply meant confidentiality, integrity, and availability. CIA. A standard security model that guides some of the best cybersecurity practices. CIA is why the federal government, <coughs> alongside most security experts, strictly warn against online elections. They argue that any current implementation of online voting poses a high security risk to the anonymity and integrity of the voted ballot and availability of the online election system. They even go as far as to say it is impossible for our current technology to maintain all three core security aspects that a safe system needs. And that is even if all security protocols are properly implemented. So how is online election any different from online retail where we deal with credit cards and finances? Before I answer that question, I bet most of you were not aware of my recent uploads. I suspect YouTube is burying my videos because the views are falling even though my sub count is growing. As an independent creator, I need your support to sustain this channel. So make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell, comment how much you enjoy watching and engage with others, share my videos, and donate a few bucks to help cover my expenses. Without your support, this channel would be nothing, so thank you. Also, special announcement, I have a merch store now, yay! I was supposed to launch it earlier, but I suck, so it is what it is. Check it out on my channel if you're interested in supporting me this way. It's just a few t-shirts and hoodies. All the designs are made by myself, so if you like it, I'd appreciate your support. Thanks again. If you think that if online banking is safe, online voting must be safe too, you falsely assume that online banking or retail are safe, when in fact, they increasingly aren't. Yes, increasingly. So let's address that. Despite more and more security hardening, cybercrime is a $6 trillion market. Every time you use your credit card, businesses are running a risk of accepting fraudulent transactions. You may not realize it, but you are paying for the cost of credit card fraud in the form of higher prices, interest rates, or transaction fees. In the US alone, credit card fraud cost $24.26 billion in 2018, and cases are climbing fast. That's 24 billion pieces of evidence that online transactions are not safe. We just learn to accept the risk, but we may run out of patience very soon. Clearly, we accept this risk and have systems in place to make the damage from fraud manageable. So why are experts saying we can secure online elections the same way? Because online elections require a much higher security model than anything else we are dealing with. While it is possible to provide some level of security for retail following the CIA model, following this principle in online elections delivers mutually exclusive outcomes. Let's dissect confidentiality. You can achieve confidentiality with privacy, secrecy, or anonymity. Online transactions are private, only the parties participating in it know all the details. But they are not anonymous. Identities of all the parties are closely monitored. Exact locations, dates and times are copied in receipts and copies of those receipts are kept for records by all involved parties. In contrast, voted ballots are anonymous. Election officials may 
request identification to check your eligibility to vote, but they are not allowed to link your ID to your ballot. It is also illegal for voters to create evidence of their voting. For instance, you can't take a picture of your vote to show it outside the polling station. This is necessary to prevent vote selling. It is possible to make online elections anonymous as well, but it would create two new problems. First of all, checking the eligibility of anonymously voted online ballots would be impossible. On the internet, there is no difference between a bot, a foreign hacker, or a human eligible to vote. There could be a system where each user of a voting app would register with a government-issued ID card with a unique encryption key embedded in its chip. Such ID cards don't exist in the US and most likely never will. In such a case, a series of identity identification steps may be needed to prove someone's eligibility to vote and scrape those details when the vote is sent from a user's device to the election servers. Congratulations! Now we developed a functioning anonymous online voting system that can distinguish between a real humans eligible to vote and bots or hackers. But we created another problem. How can you make sure your vote actually made it to the polling server? And how can the server know the vote you cast is actually the one you intended to? This is a problem of integrity, because anonymity is not necessary with online transactions. Each party can verify receipts with each other. With elections, you are directly present at a polling place when you cast your ballot, and there is no possibility to change the ballot when the ballot boxes are open for counting. There are poll watchers representative of each candidate or party, and election committees making sure all ballots are counted transparently. But when you take this process online, suddenly there are no poll watchers or committees, and between you and the polling server stands the entire global internet network full of highly motivated adversaries perfectly capable of intercepting your traffic and changing your vote without you or the polling server ever knowing about it. <coughs> polling servers would also have no way of verifying whether the votes were indeed cast as their voters intended to. The only way to verify the vote would be from the voter side, where the server could generate a unique hash code that could only match your exact vote. If it's the same as the hash generated by your app, your vote was recorded correctly. If the hash doesn't match, your vote was compromised. Sounds legit? Not so fast. Remember how it is illegal to generate evidence of your voted ballots? This is exactly that. The only way to verify your vote wasn't meddled with is to break the fundamental secrecy of the ballot, to provide a mathematical evidence to the voter, which the voter can then use for vote selling. Because online elections have to be anonymous, and there has to be a transparent oversight, it is technologically impossible to achieve both confidentiality and election integrity at the same time. This alone makes any online elections unsecured, but it gets worse with availability. In cyber security, availability means taking measures to prevent a service from being denied access. This can include preventing a range of issues, from data corruption through power outage to a denial of service attacks. Because online transactions only need to be private and not anonymous, retail websites and banks can use anti-DDoS services such as Cloudflare to mitigate the threat of such attacks. By closely monitoring and analyzing network traffic, a mitigation service such as Cloudflare is able to identify legitimate users and detect bots making an attack. Without this mitigation, an attacker from anywhere in the world could easily create swaths of bots directed at a particular website or a server to overwhelm its traffic to the point legitimate users can't access it. It's not a perfect countermeasure, but if you can't send your transaction at a given moment, you can always do it later. But everything breaks down when it comes to online elections. To prevent DDoS attacks, your voting activity would have to be monitored by mitigation services. This is a huge privacy risk, and even if you accept it, mitigating DDoS attacks will never be perfect. Even if just 1% of attacks slip through, it could mean taking down election servers for millions of people, make it impossible for them to cast their votes. And unlike with online transactions, there is a final deadline beyond which no more ballots can be voted. Equal availability for all voters without discrimination is impossible to guarantee in online voting. And to make matters even more interesting, it is possible to make these attacks look like they were coming from a party that had nothing to do with it. With our current technology, all efforts of developing online election systems will fail to meet basic CIA security criteria. But even if we develop new technologies, online voting will still remain extremely vulnerable. The whole approach of creating an app people can download on their phones 
or make a website for voters to log into is doomed to fail. User devices today are fundamentally untrustworthy. Most people lack the necessary security knowledge to avoid getting their devices compromised with malware. Voters can't trust their phone's software or hardware are not compromised, and they can't verify whether their networks aren't compromised either. It is possible for hackers to attack user devices to monitor who they vote for or even change their votes remotely without users ever noticing. Such attacks are simpler than you might think. Your devices may be tricked into connecting to a hostile network controlled by an adversary who can manipulate what content you see on your devices. At that point, anything is possible for a hacker to do. Steal your vote, record it, or change it on the way to the polling server. This is a perfect demonstration of how these sort of attacks work. It's always been known that you can modify content when the person's already on a network. I demonstrated that all of our mobile devices will automatically join a network just based off the name, even if it's not really that network, even if it doesn't have the same unique identifiers or characteristics. So if you go to a website, I can control what you see on that website. If you go to a bank, I can make your credentials go to me. I can change things on the fly. Open up your browser, go to vice.com. It should look pretty normal for the most part. <laughs> yeah, for the most part. For the most part. <laughs> Except for now there's an article about uh, Sammy's drones on the homepage of vice.com. These attacks can also be coordinated and distributed to a particular demographic. In 2019, possibly tens of thousands of iPhone users were remotely compromised by an advanced hacker group. The victims had all their private data stolen directly from their phones, including their photos, messages, and passwords. And this campaign was going on undetected for over a year. How do you think the US populace would react if they found out election apps of hundreds of thousands of users in key states were compromised? Probably not very well. Foreign adversaries aren't your only concern, they also aren't your top concern. The surveillance capabilities of domestic intelligence agencies make any effort of making online elections anonymous and intact futile. One of the Snowden leaks revealed the NSA was installing implants into consumer routers for surveillance. This was seven years ago. Today, we should treat every network as hostile and potentially controlled by intelligence agencies. The NSA doesn't have the power to change the paper ballots in bulk, but it would have the power to sway online elections in whatever way they want. Attacking the supply chain is an increasingly more relevant threat, as economic production and delivery of core components is becoming centralized to a handful of large corporations. And cyber attacks don't even need to be sophisticated. As soon as a new voting app is announced, for the next election, fake, malicious versions of it will immediately pop out everywhere, bombarding people with phishing emails, fraudulent ads, and fake news on social media. Hackers don't even need to be hugely successful. Tricking just a few percentage points of voters can sway the election or severely undermine people's trust in its integrity. Malicious cyber attacks are on the rise. Just in the first three months of the pandemic, mobile phishing attacks have increased by 37% as a result of more people working from home. There is a very good chance that thousands of you who have watched this video will be pawned in the near future. Just take paper ballots as a frame of reference. It is theoretically possible to compromise paper ballots, but you have to be physically on the ground and expand your operation into multiple areas to even begin getting into significant numbers. Physical election systems are sufficiently decentralized. With online elections, you expand your attack surface to the entire planet, and your online servers are central points of failure. Any script kitty living in their mom's basement could very efficiently troll any online election system. Now, it is impossible to talk about online elections without mentioning Estonia. Estonia has had online voting since 2005, and the country is standing proud behind their digital project, with over a third of the voters now returning their ballots online. In Estonia, 99% of government services are available digitally, so online elections are kind of a matter of national pride for Estonians. But hopes and dreams can only carry you so far before you wake up into a nightmare. Where's the money, Lebowski? When researchers analyzed Estonia's voting system for vulnerabilities, they didn't just find software bugs, they uncovered ridiculous failures in operation security. Their official video showed Wi-Fi passwords posted on the wall, shots of sysadmins typing root passwords, 
and staff playing poker stars on the same software that served Estonian elections. The researchers concluded that if software holes were so severe, they recommended the Estonian's voting system should be immediately discontinued. The National Election Committee politely rejected their recommendations, saying, We believe that online balloting allows us to achieve a level of security greater than what is possible with paper ballots. You taking a piss? Estonia has done a lot of things right. The election software is published on GitHub as open source, voter registration is tied to Estonia's encrypted national ID cards, and the system offers ballot verification QR codes that can only be generated by having access to two voter machines. But a compromised user device would still allow attackers to spoof verification QR codes as well as spy on voters' choices. Any system is only as secure as its weakest link. Estonia's voting system is blindly trusting consumer devices of users who have no security expertise and often fail to follow basic security practices such as keeping software updated, avoiding malicious apps, and resisting phishing attacks. Another elephant in the room is blockchain. There's been a lot of buzzwords around transparent blockchains solving the problem of election integrity for good. Blockchains can be based on different concepts of security, all of which bring different outcomes. The universal benefit of blockchains is that they make it computationally costly to retroactively change the data once it was written on the ledger. Each data point on the ledger needs to be validated, and each new computation uses data from the previous ones to generate new calculations. Rewriting historical data points will require recalculating all the computations on the blockchain from that point into the present. Long story short, the longer the data has been written in the ledger, the harder it is to change it. However, that doesn't mean blockchains are impenetrable. Decentralized blockchains are only as secure if a majority of computational power is sufficiently distributed among benign participants. But it is possible for a single entity or a group to collude to generate the majority share on the network. This has even happened to Bitcoin itself, when a mining pool achieved dangerous shares of computational power on the Bitcoin network. Nothing bad happened then, but with online elections, the partisan incentive would be undeniable. In case of a collusion on an election blockchain, it would be possible for adversaries to create different versions of the blockchain for different people. They could also prevent certain votes from being written into the ledger. You can only imagine what this would do to the American discourse. These attacks happened to smaller blockchains in the past, and they would definitely be attempted in online elections too. Blockchains use private encryption keys to write data into the ledger. On most cryptocurrencies, users can generate as many private keys as they like. With online elections, the generation of these keys would have to be tied to some identifiable information unique to each voter because of the whole one person equals one vote thing. Private keys of voters could be generated from national ID cards, as mentioned before, with these encrypted chips. However, if these private keys are lost or stolen, a voter would lose their ability to participate. Encrypted ID cards aren't unhackable either. Critical flaw in factorization discovered in 2017 allowed hackers to impersonate key owners, decrypt sensitive data, and implant malware into digitally signed software. This flaw has been present in millions of ID cards for five years before it was discovered by researchers. In Estonia, 750,000 ID cards issued since 2014 were vulnerable, which forced Estonian officials to close their database of ID card public keys. No amount of blockchain would protect against such a critical vulnerability. And blockchains aren't immune to vulnerabilities either. In fact, they introduce more complexity to software updates. In 2020, over a quarter of the Bitcoin network was still open to a resource consumption denial of service vulnerability disclosed in 2018. Voting is too critical to move so slowly with security updates. The bottom line is, we've been securing paper records for thousands of years. We know how to make them private, anonymous, encrypted, backed up, or temper resistant. Everybody understands paper. Contrast that with the internet, which we've only had for the last few decades. And it wasn't heavily commercialized until the late 90s. We still don't have a full-grown generation of people who did not know the days before the commercial internet. I personally think that any effort to make online elections a thing should involve dedicated voting devices. Online voting 
shouldn't be based on an app or a website that people can use from the same devices they use for everything else. Devices that can run Facebook ads cannot be trusted. And these voting devices should not be regular phones either. They would have to be hardened to the point they can only run election software and nothing else, with over-the-air security updates installed automatically without user approval. Everything from top to bottom, hardware, firmware and software would have to be fully open source and available for researchers to break into and find vulnerabilities. A generous bug bounty program is a necessity, offering $10 million or more to anyone who finds exploitable bugs that could lead to attackers compromising election confidentiality, integrity or availability. Securing online elections would have to be a continuous multi-billion dollar effort. It's definitely not something a random company out of nowhere can pull off. If you like what I do here, please support this channel with engagement or donations through channel membership or Patreon. Share the video and subscribe for future uploads. Thanks for watching.